Herodotus Histories, Part 5 of Book 1. As soon as the Lydians had been subdued by the Persians, the Ionians and Aeolians sent messengers to Cyrus, offering to be his subjects on the same terms as those which they had under Crassus. Having heard what they proposed, Cyrus told them a story. Once, he said, there was a flute player who saw fishes in the sea and played upon his flute, thinking that they would come out onto the land. Being disappointed of his hope, he took a net and gathered in and drew out a great multitude of the fishes, and seeing them leaping, You had best, said he, cease from your dancing now. You would not come out and dance then when I played to you. The reason why Cyrus told the story to the Ionians and Iolians was that the Ionians, who were ready to obey him when the victory was won, had before refused when he sent a message asking them to revolt from Croesus. So he answered them in his anger. But when the message came to the Ionians in their cities, they fortified themselves severally with walls, and assembled in the Panionion, all except the Milesians, with whom alone Cyrus had made a treaty, on the same terms as that which they had with the Lydians. The rest of the Ionians resolved to send envoys in the name of them all to Sparta, to ask help for the Ionians. So, too little too late here. The Ionians are trying to get better terms for surrender, and Cyrus is like, oh no. The time for that is over. You would not accept the terms. Now I've won the battle. It's going to be on my terms now. So the Ionians are preparing for the sieges and they're trying to get support from mainland Greece. Now these Ionians who possessed the Panionion had set their cities in places more favored by skies and seasons than any country known to us. For neither to the north of them, nor to the south, nor to the east, nor to the west, does the land accomplish the same effect as Ionia, being afflicted here by the cold and wet, there by the heat and drought? They use not all the same speech, but four different dialects. Miletus lies farthest south among them, and next to it come Myos and Priene. These are settlements in Caria, and they use a common language. Ephesus, Colophon, Lebedos, Teos, Clazomenae, Phocea, all of them being in Lydia, have language in common, which is wholly different from the speech of the three cities aforementioned. There are yet three Ionian cities, two of them situated on the islands of Samos and Chios, and one, Erythrae, on the mainland. The Chians and Erythraeans speak alike, but the Samians have a language which is their own, and none others. It is thus seen that there are four fashions of speech. So within this one ethnic grouping of Asiatic Greeks, on the coastland, the Ionians, we have four different dialects, almost different languages in some cases. Very remarkable. But this place on the coast is noted for its being very temperate, good place to live. We'll see some pictures of that in a little bit. Among these Ionians, the Milesians had sheltered from the danger, for they had made a treaty. And the islanders among them had nothing to fear. For the Phoenicians were not yet subjects of the Persians, nor were the Persians themselves shipped men. But they of Asia were cut off from the rest of the Ionians in no other way save as I shall show. The whole Hellenic race was then but small, and the least of all its parts, and the least regarded, was the Ionian stock. For saving Athens it had no considerable city. Now the Athenians and the rest would not be called Ionians, but spurned the name. Nay, even now the greater number of them seem to me to be ashamed of it. But the twelve cities aforesaid gloried in this name, and founded a holy place for themselves, which they called the Panionion, and agreed among them to allow no other Ionians to use it, nor indeed did any, save the men of Smyrna, ask to be admitted. So at this time, the Hellenic or Greek race is not a large and mighty people yet, and of that race, the Ionian is the smallest and sort of least important part of that race. And he points out that it seems like even in Herodotus's time, they still were not proud of being Ionians. They didn't have very much going for them. They didn't have any significant city besides Athens. With the exception of this area, these Ionians dwelling here on the coast of Turkey, uh, who built the Panionion. Even as the Dorians of what is now called the country of the five cities, the same being formerly called the country of the six cities, forbid the admitting of any of the neighboring Dorians to the Triopian temple. Nay, they barred from sharing the use of it even those of their own body who had broken the temple law. For long ago in the games in honor of Triopian Apollo, they offered certain bronze tripods to the victors, 
And those who won these must not carry them away from the temple, but dedicate them there to the god. Now a man of Halicarnassus, called Agasicles, being a winner, disregarded this law, and carrying the tripod away, nailed it to the wall of his own house. For this offense, the five cities, Lindus, Ialis, Ialysus, Camirus, Kos, and Cnidus, forbade the sixth city, Halicarnassus, to share in the use of the temple. Such was the penalty imposed on the Halicarnassians. So remember, Herodotus is himself a Halicarnassian, and he's telling how the Dorians also kind of did a similar thing to the Ionians. They had one common temple that was used for all the different uh, smaller city-states of that ethnic group. But here in this story, he's telling how his own hometown, Halicarnassus, got excluded from that because one of the athletes from their town disregarded the temple laws. As for the Ionians, the reason why they made twelve cities and would admit no more was in my judgment this, that there were twelve divisions of them when they dwelt in Peloponnesus, just as there are twelve divisions of the Achaeans who drove the Ionians out, Pelene nearest to Sicyon, then Aegira and Aegea, where is the never-failing river Crathis, from which the river in Italy took its name, Bura and Helis, whither the Ionians fled when they were worsted in battle by the Achaeans, Aegeon, Hrypae, Patre, Pharae, and Olenus, where is the great river Pyrrhus, Dime, and Tritae, the only inland city of all of these. These were the twelve divisions of the Ionians, as they are now of the Achaeans. For this reason the Ionians too made twelve cities, and for no other. For it were but foolishness to say that these are more truly Ionian or better born than the other Ionians, seeing that not the least part of them are Abantes from Obea, who are not Ionians even in name, and that they are mingled with them Minians of Orchomenus, Cadmeans, Dryopians, Phocian seceders from their nation, Molossians, Pelasgian Arcadians, Dorians of Epidaurus, and many other tribes. And as for those who came from the very town hall of Athens and deemed themselves the best born of the Ionians, these did not bring wives with them to their settlements, but married Carian women, whose parents they had put to death. For this slaughter these women made a custom and bound themselves by oath and enjoined the same on their daughters, that none would sit at meat with her husband nor call him by his name, because the men had married them after slaying their fathers and husbands and sons. So, in this catalog of all the different tribes and the divisions of the Ionians and the admixture of the Ionians with the other tribal groups in the area, you can see how confusing it is and why basically Herodotus is stressing the point we don't need to worry too much about the Ionian ethnic pedigree because it's already so muddled with all these other people. But you can see in this picture here the Ionian coast and think back to what he was saying earlier about Ionia being sort of remarkable and unique for its beautiful temperateness. So these people came from Achaea, which is in the Peloponnesian Peninsula, and they, they sailed across the Aegean and settled this area on Asia, on the coast of Asia Minor, the Ionian coast. But when the Athenian colonists got there, he recounts how they basically slaughtered all the males of the Carians and then took the Carian women to be their wives. And so the Carian women would not sit at meals with their husband or call them by name. And they, they swore this by oath and they, they made their daughters take the oath too. So this colony certainly got off to a rocky start. This happened at Miletus. And for kings, some of them chose Lycian descendants of Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, and some Chalcones of Pylus, descendants of Codrus, son of Melanthus, and some both. Yet seeing that they set more store by the name than the rest of the Ionians, let it be granted that those of pure birth are Ionians, and all are Ionians who are of Athenian descent, and keep the feast of Apaturia. All do so keep it, saving the men of Ephesus and Colophon. These are the only Ionians who do not keep it, and these by reason, they say, of a certain deed of blood. The Pan-Ionion is a sacred ground in Mycale, facing the north. It was set apart for Poseidon of Helicon by the joint will of the Ionians. Mikale is a western promontory of the mainland opposite of Samos. The Ionians were wont to assemble there from their cities and keep the festival to which they gave the name of Panionia. The names of all the Greek festivals, not the Ionian alone, 
and alike in the same letter, just as do the names of the Persians. So it's giving a little bit of background now to this Panionia festival and the location of it, which was called the Panionion. Pan, of course, meaning all or for all, and then Ionia being the Ionians. So this would be the festival for all Ionians, sort of like a Highland Games, if you will, for the ancient Ionians of this coastal region. And he points out that all Greek festivals end in the same letter, just as do the names of the Persians, although we saw that that's not actually accurate in the case of the Persian names. There are some exceptions to that. But anyway, he's still going through trying to piece apart the rough general region of the Ionians and figure out who actually is Ionian, who who isn't, and what makes an Ionian an Ionian, and it's still very, very convoluted and difficult to make sense of. So we're not going to spend too much time trying to go through these lineages and descents. Just be aware that that region of the coast of Turkey was the Ionian region, that those colonists of Athenian descent were Ionians, and the rest of them are roughly considered to be Ionians. And they had this sacred festival at this sacred place where all the Ionians of the Ionian cities on the coast would come together for the festival. I have now told of the Ionian cities. The Aeolian cities are these. Chime, called Friconian, Larissae, the new fort, Temnos, Cilia, Notium, Aegeresa, Pitana, Aegea, Merina, Granea. These are the ancient Aeolian cities, eleven in number. These two, the mainland cities, were once twelve, but one of them, Smyrna, was taken away by the Ionians. These Aeolians had settled where the land was better than the Ionian territory, but the climate was not so good. Now this is how the Aeolians lost Smyrna. Certain men of Colophon, worsted in civil strife and banished from their country, had been received by them into the town. These Colophonian exiles waited for the time when the men of Smyrna were holding a festival to Dionysus outside the walls. They then shut the gates and so won the city. Then all the Aeolians came to recover it, and an agreement was made, whereby the Aeolians should receive back their movable goods from the Ionians and quit the city. This being done, the other eleven cities divided the Smyrnaeans among themselves and made them citizens of their own. So that's quite a devious ruse on the part of the Colophonian exiles. They lost whatever conflict they were fighting in and had been banished from their country, and so they were taken in by the city of Smyrna. They waited in the city until all the men left and then just shut the gates and conquered it. So the Aeolians lost their city. So you got to be wary of these Greek exiles trying to take shelter in your city. These then are the Aeolian cities of the mainland, besides those that are situated on Ida and are separate. Among those on the islands, five divide Lesbos among them. There was a sixth on Lesbos, Arispa, but its people were enslaved by their kinsfolk of Methymna. There is one on Tenedos, and one again in the Hundred Isles, as they are called. The men of Lesbos and Tenedos, then, like the Ionian islanders, have nothing to fear. The rest of the cities took counsel together and resolved to follow whither the Ionians should lead. So just like with the Ionians, a good portion of the Aeolian people live on these islands away from the coast. And so you have the mainland cities and then you have the island cities. And what Herodotus is pointing out here is that the Persians don't yet have a powerful navy. They have not conquered the Phoenicians. They themselves are inland people. Remember, they're mountain and desert people. They're not seafarers. They don't know the art of building ships or navigating or sailing and all these things. So the islanders are not too worried yet about the Persians, but the mainland Greeks are trying to figure out what to do. And the Ionians are taking charge. The Aeolians are going to listen to what they come up with and try to follow their lead and hopefully stave off the Persian attack. So when the envoys of the Ionians and Aeolians came to Sparta, for this was set afoot with all speed, they chose the Phocian, whose name was Pythermos, to speak for all. He then put on a purple cloak that as many Spartans as possible might assemble to hear him, and stood up and made a long speech asking aid for his people. But the Lacedaemonians would not listen to him and refused to aid the Ionians. So the Ionians departed. But the Lacedaemonians, though they had rejected their envoys, did nevertheless send men in a ship of fifty oars to see, as I suppose, how it fared with Cyrus and Ionia. 
These coming to Phocea sent Lacrines, who was the most esteemed among them, to Sardis, to repeat here to Cyrus a proclamation of the Lacedaemonians, that he must harm no city on Greek territory, else the Lacedaemonians would punish him. So, in typical Spartan fashion, they initially refuse to help, but end up sending these envoys to basically warn the Persian king that if any of the Greeks are attacked, they would get Spartans for enemies. When the herald had so spoken, Cyrus, it is said, asked the Greeks that were present who and how many in number were these Lacedaemonians who made him this declaration. When he was told, he said to the Spartan herald, I never yet feared men who have a place set apart in the midst of their city where they perjure themselves and deceive each other. These, if I keep my health, shall have their own mishaps to talk of, not those of the Ionians. This threat he uttered against the whole Greek nation, because they have marketplaces and buy and sell there. For the Persians themselves use no marketplaces, nor have they such at all. Presently, entrusting Sardis to a Persian called Tabalus, and charging Pactyes, a Lydian, to take charge of the gold of Crasus and the Lydians, he himself marched away to Agbatana, taking with him Crasus, and at first making no account of the Ionians. For he had Babylon on his hands, and the Bactrian nation, and the Sakai, and the Egyptians. He was minded to lead an army himself against these, and to send another commander against the Ionians. Right, so the Spartans warn him that if he attacks the Greeks, he's going to make enemies of the Spartans, and he sort of laughs them off. This is a little bit of foreshadowing, because the Spartans would end up becoming one of the pivotal players in the later Persian wars. But Cyrus is not worried about them. He says, I have nothing to fear from people who have a place in their city where they go to lie and cheat. They perjure themselves and deceive each other. Speaking about the marketplace, what the ancient Greeks called the Agora, which was more than just like a shopping mall. There was stalls for buying and selling things. There were temples. There would usually be sort of public assembly spaces, spaces for speakers to get up and present things or present political arguments and things like that. But the Persians looked down on this very much. They viewed this as a dishonest and dishonorable place. And so he's sort of using this to throw in the Spartans' faces and mock the Greek way of life as less virtuous than the Persian way of life. But he's not really worried about the Greeks yet. He's collecting his forces and he's heading back east to the Persian Empire. He's trying to consolidate because he has a lot of things going on. He's dealing with the invasion of Babylon, uh, the Bactrians, which are to the east of Persia, kind of like modern day Afghanistan. You have these other tribes over there that he's trying to subdue and also the Egyptians. So he's not worried about the Ionians yet. He's leaving some generals behind to handle that. And he's going to go consolidate his expanding empire. But no sooner had Cyrus marched away from Sardis than Pactyes made the Lydians to revolt from Tabalus and Cyrus. And he went down to the sea where, as he had all the gold of Sardis, he hired soldiers and persuaded the men of the coast to join his army. Then marching to Sardis, he penned Tabalus in the citadel and besieged him there. So this occurred shortly after Sardis had already been sacked and taken down and once again Tablus is besieged inside the citadel so you can't imagine this is a very well defended place at this point when cyrus had news of this on his journey he said to croesus what end am i to make croesus of this business it seems that the lydians will never cease making trouble for me and for themselves it is in my mind that it may be best to make slaves of them for now methinks i have done like one that should slay the father and spare the children so likewise I have taken with me you, who were more than a father to the Lydians, and handed the city over to the Lydians themselves, and then forsooth I marvel that they revolt. So Cyrus uttered his thought, but Croesus feared that he would destroy Sardis, and thus answered him, O king, what you say is but reasonable, yet do not ever the former and of the latter offense. For the beginning was my work, and on my head is the penalty. But it is Pactyes, in whose charge you left Sardis, who does this present wrong. Let him therefore be punished, but let the Lydians be pardoned, and lay on them this command, that they may not revolt or be dangerous to you. Send, I say, and forbid them to possess weapons of war, and command them to wear tunics under their cloaks, and buskins on their feet, and to teach their sons lyre-playing, and song, and dance, and huckstering. Then, O king, you will soon see them turn to women instead of men, 
and thus you need not fear lest they revolt. So Crassus is advocating for mercy for his people. He doesn't want to see the Lydians reduced to slavery. He's encouraging Cyrus just to punish the man who led the revolt. But he gives some very interesting advice here. He says, command them not to revolt against you, which that would be a questionable command in any case, because obviously if somebody is revolting, they are not really paying attention to commands from a king, are they? But he gives him further advice. He says, let them wear tunics, forbid them to possess weapons of war, teach them lyre playing and song and dance and huckstering, all these things. Basically what he's advocating here is that you should culturally feminize them, make them unaccustomed to war, unaccustomed to protecting themselves and providing for themselves. Instead, accustom them to a life of luxury and entertainment so that they'll become weak and effeminate, not like the kind of men who might be a threat to you, who value their independence and have the wherewithal to rise up and to take risks, but instead to make them too comfortable too afraid to rise up again. Such counsel Croesus gave Cyrus, because he thought this was better for the Lydians than to be sold as slaves. He knew that without some reasonable plea he could not change the king's purpose, and feared that even if the Lydians should now escape, they might afterwards revolt and be destroyed by the Persians. Cyrus was pleased by this counsel. He abated his anger and said he would follow Croesus's advice. Then calling Mazares, a Mede, he charged him to give the Lydians the commands which Croesus advised, further to enslave all the others who had joined the Lydians in attacking Sardis, and as for Pactyes himself, to bring him by whatever means into his presence alive. Having given these commands on his journey, he marched away into the Persian country. But Pactyes, learning that an army sent against him was drawing near, was affrighted and fled to Syme. Mazaris the Mede, when he came to Sardis with whatever part he had of Cyrus's army, and found Pactyes' followers no longer there, first of all compelled the Lydians to carry out Cyrus's commands, and by his order they changed their whole manner of life. After this, he sent messengers to Syme, demanding that Pactyes be given up. The Cymaeans resolved to make the god at Brachidae their judge as to what counsel they should take. For there was there an ancient place of divination, which all the Ionians and Aeolians were wont to consult. The place is in the land of Miletus, above the harbor of Panormus. So Pactyes flees for shelter, and the Simeans took him in, and they're on the fence about whether they should protect him or whether they should turn him over to Mazares, Cyrus's general. And so, in good Greek fashion, they consult the oracle. This is not the oracle of Delphi. This is a local oracle there near Miletus, but another famous one, which is mentioned in other places, the oracle of Branchidae. They go to consult the oracle to find out what they should do. The men of Syme then sent to Brancidae to inquire of the shrine what they should do in the matter of Pactyes that should be most pleasing to the gods, and the oracle replied that they must give Pactyes up to the Persians. When this answer came back to them, they set about giving him up. But while the greater part were for doing this, Aristodicus, son of Heraclides, a notable man among the citizens, stayed the men of Syme from this deed, for he disbelieved the oracle, and thought that those who had inquired of the gods spoke untruly till at last a second band of inquirers was sent to inquire concerning Pactyes, among whom was Aristodicus. So this man is skeptical of the advice from the oracle. As always, the oracles could be cryptic, but also they relied on messengers to go to the oracle and bring the message back. And if those messengers had an agenda, then you can understand how accepting what they say might be problematic. In some cases, there might be cause for suspicion, and that is the case for Aristodicus. The advice does not seem fitting advice coming from a god. We'll see why in a moment. When they came to Branchidae, Aristodicus, speaking for all, put this question to the oracle. O king, Pactyes the Lydian hath fled to us for refuge to save him from a violent death at the hands of the Persians, and they demand him of us, bidding the men of Syme to give him up. But we, for all that we fear the Persian power, have not made bold to give up this our suppliant, until thy will be made clearly known to us whether we shall do this or not. Thus Aristodicus questioned, and the god gave again the same answer, that Pactyes should be delivered up to the Persians. 
With that, Aristodicus did as he had already purposed. He went round about the temple and stole away the sparrows and all the other families of nesting birds that were in it. But while he did so, a voice, they say, came out of the inner shrine, calling to Aristodicus and saying, Thou wickedest of men, wherefore darest thou do this? Wilt thou rob my temple of those that take refuge with me? Then Aristodicus had his answer ready. O king, said he, wilt thou thus save thine own suppliants, yet bid the men of Simon to deliver up theirs? But the god made answer, Yea, I do bid them, that you may the sooner perish for your impiety, and never again come to inquire my oracle concerning the giving up of them that seek refuge with you. So Aristodicus's ploy to put the god to the test here has the desired effect. He he takes the little birds that are sheltering around the temple, and the god gets angry at him and says, How dare you remove those who come to my temple as a place of safety? And Arist Aristodicus asks, But you want us to give over the man who has fled to us, seeking our safety? What he's referencing here is what the Greeks called xenia, and this is an ancient Greek code of hospitality. It included all these rituals of guest friendship. Now, this code was a very serious religious obligation that had many aspects, but one of the major aspects was to shelter and defend a guest who came to you for protection. So this was a big deal across the whole Greek and even wider classical world, the Aegean world, where if a guest showed up, you had to offer them hospitality, no questions asked. You gave them food. Oftentimes, if you did it really well, you would give them a feast, you would entertain them, then you would ask them their purpose, and they would tell you their name and where they came from. They will provide you with news from the outside world. This code of hospitality was so important that the Greeks believed Zeus himself was responsible for enforcing it. The king of the gods was the god of Xenia, and he would enforce and punish violations of this code. And they even believed that Zeus in particular, but even other gods, would from time to time walk the earth disguised as poor humans seeking hospitality from people just to test the piety of the people there. If they were received well and treated with Xenia, then the gods would bless that household. But if they were treated poorly, the gods would punish that household. So what we see in the answer of the oracle here is the answer itself was essentially a punishment on the people of Siamese for their impiety, for even daring to ask the question, should you give up someone who's fled to you for protection? Of course not. That's impious. It's wicked. Uh, this type of code continues to endure in some places in the world nowadays. For example, the Afghan code of Pashtunwali and other similar tribal practices are modern cognates of this ancient guest friendship culture. They still practice that to some degree or another. In Afghanistan, if you go to someone's house, you can essentially walk into their house and demand food and a place to sleep, and it's given without question. Even if someone is an enemy, they will give them shelter, give them food. It's a common part of their culture. Likewise, for example, in Iraq, if you go there, if you go into someone's house, if you're a guest in someone's house in Iraq, and you compliment something that that host has, the host is obligated to give it to you. So if you're like, oh, that's, that's a very nice piece of art on the wall, the host will take the art off the wall and hand it to you and insist that you take it because they still have this enduring, very strong sense of the obligations of hospitality. It's one of the most important parts of ancient ethics. When this answer was brought to the hearing of the Simeans, they sent Pactyes away to Mytilene, for they desire neither to perish for delivering him up, nor to be besieged for keeping him with them. So they offloaded the responsibility. Then Mazaris sent a message to Mytilene demanding the surrender of Pactyes, and the Mytileneans prepared to give him for a price. I cannot say with exactness how much it was, for the bargain was never fulfilled. For when the Simeans learned that the Mytileneans had this in hand, they sent a ship to Lesbos and brought Pactyes away to Chios. Thence he was dragged out of the temple of city-guarding Athene and delivered up to the Chians, they receiving him in return Atarnaeus, which is a district in Mycia, over against Lesbos. The Persians thus received Pactyes and kept him guarded, that they might show him to Cyrus. And for a long time no Chian would offer sacrifice of barley meal from this land of Atarnaeus to any god, 
or make sacrificial cakes of what grew there. Nothing that came from that country might be used for any sacred rite. So they're continuing to shuffle this guy around, trying to keep him away from the Persians, while also not inviting siege on their own city. So he ends up in Chios, where he is betrayed. He's dragged out of the temple there and handed over to the Persians. And in return for this, the Chians got a district of land. But even with that trade-off, they still would not use anything that grew on that land as any type of liturgical offering because it was viewed as tainted or unclean because of this act of betrayal of Xenia. Pactyes being then delivered up by the Chians, Masaryes presently led his army against those who had helped to besiege Tabalus, and he enslaved the people of Priene and overran the plain of, of the Meandrus, giving it up to his army to pillage, and Magnesia likewise. Immediately after this he died of a sickness. After his death, Harpagus came down to succeed him in his command, a Median like Masaryes. This is that Harpagus who was entertained by Astyages, the Median king, at that unnatural feast, and who helped to win the kingship for, for Cyrus. This man was now made general by Cyrus. When he came to Ionia, he took the cities by building mounds. He would drive the men within their walls and then build mounds against the walls, and so take their cities. So this is the same guy we heard about earlier, Harpagus, who was supposed to be in charge of killing Cyrus, but instead gave him to the shepherd who raised him, and then Astyages in vengeance killed and fed him his own son. And Harpagus betrayed Astyages to Cyrus out of vengeance. Same guy. So he used to capture these cities by besieging the cities, driving all the warriors inside, and then he would build these big earth mounds up the walls so they could go over the walls and into the city. Phocaea was the first Ionian town that he assailed. These Phocaeans were the earliest of the Greeks to make long sea voyages. It was they who discovered the Adriatic Sea and Tyrrhenia and Iberia and Tartessus, not sailing in round freight ships but in fifty oared vessels. When they came to Tartessus, they made friends with the king of the Tartessians, whose name was Argenthonius. He ruled Tartessus for eighty years and lived a hundred and twenty. The Phocaeans so won this man's friendship that he first entreated them to leave Ionia and settle in his country where they would, and then, when he could not persuade them to that, and learned from them how the Median power was increasing, he gave them money to build a wall round their city therewith. Without stint he gave it, for the circuit of the wall is of many furlongs, and all this is made of great stones well fitted together. So Tartessos was an ancient region in Iberia or Spain, beyond the Pillars of Hercules. It would have been a Mediterranean colony, and the Pillars of Hercules are what we call the Straits of Gibraltar that divide the Atlantic Ocean from the Mediterranean Sea. So sailing out of the Mediterranean Sea to the west into the Atlantic, right on the other side, that region of Spain there was called Tartessos. In such a manner was the Phocaean's wall fully made. Harpagus marched against the city and besieged it, but he made overtures and said that it would suffice him if the Phocaeans would demolish one bastion of the wall and dedicate one house. But the Phocaeans, very wroth at the thought of slavery, said they desired to take counsel for one day, and then they would have answer. But while they were consulting, Harpagus must, they said, withdraw his army from the walls. Harpagus said that he knew well what they purposed to do but that nevertheless he would suffer, suffer them to take counsel. So while Harpagus withdrew his army from the walls, the Phocaeans launched their fifty-oared ships, placed in them their women and children and all movable goods, and besides the statues from the temples, and all things therein dedicated, save bronze or stonework or painting, and then themselves embarked and set sail for Chios. And the Persians took Phocaea, thus left uninhabited. So this would have been rather an empty victory right here. Harpagus just wants a token of submission. He says, demolish one bastion and dedicate one house, and we'll call it good. But the Phocaeans are suspicious of how the Persians operate. They don't want to be slaves. They don't want to be subjugated. So they come up with this ruse to allow them to escape and sail to the island where they'll be safe for at least a time. The Phocaeans would have bought of the Chians the islands called Oinousae, but the Chians would not sell them, because they feared that the islands would become a market, and so their own island be cut off from its trade. So the Phocaeans made ready to sail to Cyrenus, 
where at the command of an oracle they had twenty years before this built a city called Alalia. Argantonius was by this time dead. While making ready for their voyage, they first sailed to Phocaea, where they slew the Persian guard to whom Harpagus had entrusted the defense of the city. And this being done, they called down mighty curses on whosoever of themselves should stay behind when the rest sailed. Not only so, but they sank in the sea a mass of iron, and swore never to return to Phocaea before the iron should again appear. But while they prepared to voyage to Cyrenus, more than half of the citizens were taken with a longing and a pitiful sorrow for the city and the life of their land, and they broke their oath and sailed back to Phocaea. Those of them who kept the oath set out to sea from the Onusse. So these are obviously men of action. They're very serious about this endeavor to get away. They, they try to buy the islands, but the Chians won't sell them the islands, so they're going to keep sailing until they find a place, but not before they sail back home and kill the Persians who conquered their city. But then they decide we're abandoning this city and we're never coming back, and they call down curses and swear a solemn oath on anyone who comes back to the city. They sink the iron into the sea and say, we'll never come back until the iron rises again. But even so, as they're sailing away again, Half of the citizens get homesick and decide to stay anyway. But the rest are going to drive on. And when they came to Cyrenus, they dwelt there for five years as one body with those who had first come, and they founded temples there. But they harried and plundered all their neighbors, wherefore the Tyrenaeans and Carchedonians made common cause against them, and sailed to attack them each with sixty ships. The Phocaeans also manned their ships, sixty in number, and met the enemy in the sea called Sardonian. They joined battle, and the Phocaeans won. Yet it was but a Cadmian victory, for they lost forty of their ships, and the twenty that remained were useless, their rams being twisted awry. Then, sailing to Alalia, they took on board their children and women and all of their possessions that their ships could hold, and leaving Cyrenus, they sailed to Regium. As for the crews of the destroyed ships, the Carcadonians and the Tyrrhenians drew lots for them, and by far the greater share of them falling to the Tyranian city of Agila, the Agilians led them out and stoned them to death. But after this all from Agila, whether sheep or beasts of burden or men, that passed the place where the stoned Phocaeans lay, became distorted and crippled and palsied. The Agilians sent to Delphi, desiring to heal their offense, and the Pythian priestess bade them to do what the people of Agila to this day perform, for they pay great honors to the Phocaeans with religious rites and games and horse races. Such was the end of this portion of the Phocaeans. Those of them who fled to Regium set out from thence and gained possession of that Onotrian city, which is now called Haele. This they founded because they learned from a man of Poseidonia that when the Pythian priestess spoke of founding a settlement and of Cyrenus, it was the hero that she signified, and not the island. Thus then it fared with the Ionian Phocaei. The Tyans did in like manner with the Phocaeans, when Harpagus had taken their walled city by building a mound, they all embarked on shipboard and sailed away f for Thrace. There they founded a city, Abdera, which before this had been founded by Timasius of Clazomenae. Yet he got no good of it, but was driven out by the Thracians. This Timasius is now honored as a hero by the Tyans of Abdera. So in this ongoing saga of the Phocaeans and the other inhabitants of the coast of Asia Minor, basically that whole region is getting overrun by Harpagus, and so everybody's jumping ship, or actually boarding ship. They're all hopping in their vessels and they're sailing away from Asia Minor and settling in these various other regions. The islands there, up in Thrace, to the north of Greece, and as far west as Italy. These were the only Ionians who, being unable to endure slavery, left their native lands. The rest of the Ionians, except the Milesians, though they faced Harpagus in battle as did the exiles, and bore themselves gallantly, each fighting for his own country, yet when they were worsted and their cities taken, remained each where he was, and did as they were commanded. The Milesians, as I have already said, made a treaty with Cyrus himself, and struck no blow. Thus was Ionia for the second time enslaved. And when Harpagus had conquered the Ionians of the mainland, the Ionians of the islands, fearing the same fate, surrendered themselves to Cyrus. When the Ionians, despite their evil plight, did nevertheless assemble at the Panionion, Bias of Priene, as I have heard, gave them very useful advice, which 
Had they followed, they might have been the most prosperous of all Greeks. For he counseled them to put out to sea and sail altogether to Sardo, and then found one city for all Ionians. Thus, possessing the greatest island in the world and bearing rule over others, they would be rid of slavery and win prosperity. But if they stayed in Ionia, he could see, he said, no hope of freedom for them. Such was the counsel which Bias of Priene gave after the destruction of the Ionians, and good also was that given before the destruction by Thales of Miletus, a Phoenician by descent. He would have had the Ionians make one common place of counsel, which should be in Teos, for that was the center of Ionia, and the state of the other cities should be held to be no other than if they were but townships. Thus Bias and Thales advised. So Herodotus is making the point that the downfall of Ionia was how disorganized they were, how disunited they were. If they had followed the advice of these people, Bias of Priene and Thales of Miletus, and been unified, one people with one powerful city, and all the other cities basically as like townships, then they would have been a force to be reckoned with. They would not have so easily been able to each be individually picked off and conquered by Harpagus and the Persians. So Bias's advice was that they sail to Sardo, which is the ancient Greek name for the modern-day island of Sardinia. You can see on the map off the coast of Italy. Likewise, Chironus, that was the name for what we call Corsica. He has referenced Chironus before. So they were recommending that they sail and make colonies or build a large unified new kingdom on the island far away from the Persian threat. And Herodotus feels that if they had followed this advice, they would have fared better than all the Greeks. But unfortunately for them, they did not. And so they all eventually capitulated to the Persians. Harpagus, after subduing Ionia, made an expedition against the Carians, Caunians, and Lycians, taking with him Ionians and Aeolians. Now among these the Carians were people who had to the mainland from the islands, for in old time they were islanders, called Leleges, and under the rule of Minos, not, as far as I can learn by hearsay, paying him tribute, but manning ships for him when he needed them. Seeing then that Minos had subdued much territory to himself and was victorious in war, this made the Carians too at that time to be very far the most regarded of all nations. Three things they invented, in which they were followed by the Greeks. It was the Carians who first taught the wearing of crests on their helmets and devices on their shields, and who first made for their shields holders. Till then all who used shields carried them without these holders, and guided them with leathern baldrics which they slung around the neck and over the left shoulder. Then, a long time afterwards, the Carians were driven from the islands by Dorians and Ionians, and so came to the mainland. This is the Cretan story about the Carians, but they themselves do not consent to it, but hold that they are aboriginal dwellers on the mainland, and ever bore the name which they bear now, and they point to an ancient shrine of Carian Zeus at Mylasa, whereto Mycians and Lydians, as brethren of the Carians, for Lydos and Mysos, they say, were brothers of Car, are admitted, but none of any other nation, though they learn to speak the same language as the Carians. So he attributes a number of inventions to these people, and the one that's notable is the carriers for the shields. Now, I believe what he's referring to there is actually the arm loops that allowed the, the round Greek shield to hang suspended on the arm and to be maneuvered very easily on the arm. Whereas the older, like Mycenaean shields were these great big tall tower shields, and they were basically suspended by a leather strap or baldric over the shoulder and they would have had handles so you could move it around but it was more like a defensive a portable defensive structure to fight behind rather than the more maneuverable shield that we're familiar with from classical times that was on the warrior's arm and the king that he references minos that is a semi-legendary king of ancient crete it's after him the minoan civilization is named and he is renowned for having a great sea empire and doing things like building the labyrinth on Crete and requiring tributary sacrifices for the Minotaur, for imprisoning Daedalus and Icarus. All these stories are attributed to King Minos. The Calneans, to my mind, are aborigines of the soil, but they themselves say that they came from Crete. 
Their speech has grown like to the Carian, or the Carian to theirs, for that I cannot clearly determine. But in their customs they are widely severed from the Carians, as from all other men. Their chief pleasure is to assemble for drinking bouts, in such companies as accord with their ages and friendships, men, women, and children. Certain foreign rites of worship were established among them, but presently, when they were otherwise minded, they would worship only the gods of their fathers. All Kalnian men of full age put on their armor and went together as far as the boundaries of Kalinda, smiting the air with their spears and saying that they were casting out the stranger gods. Such are their fashions. The Lycians were of Crete in ancient times, for of old none that dwelt in Crete were Greek. Now there was a dispute in Crete about the royal power between Sarpedon and Minos, sons of Europe. Minos prevailed in this division and drove out Sarpedon and his partisans, who, being thrust out, came to the Milian land in Asia. What is now possessed by the Lycians was of old Milian, and the Milians were then called Solimai. For a while Sarpedon ruled them, and the people were called Termilai, which was the name that they had brought with them and that is still given to the Lycians by their neighbors. But after the coming from Athens of Lycus, son of Pandion, another exile, banished by his brother Aegeus, to join Sarpedon in the land of the Termili, they came in time to be called Lycians, after Lycus. Their customs are in part Cretan and in part Carian, but they have one which is their own and shared by no other men. They take their names not from their fathers, but from their mothers, and when one is asked by his neighbor who he is, he will say that he is the son of such a mother, and recount the mothers of his mother. Nay, if a woman of full rights marry a slave, her children are deemed pure-born, and if a true-born Lycian man takes a stranger wife or concubine, the children are dishonored, though he be the first in the land. So all of these different minor ethnic groups here around the coastlands of Asia Minor, they seem to be either descended from the Cretans or have some kind of relation to the Cretans. Very, very early colonizing efforts from dwellers in the Aegean to the coast of Asia Minor and probably also mixed in with natives of the region itself, as Herodotus indicates. But this last group, the Lycians, he mentions how peculiar it was that they took their names from their mothers and traced ancestry from the mothers. This type of ancestry, this is called matrilineal. In other words, they trace ancestry through the mother's line rather than the father's line. There are several types of people historically who have done this, this does happen from time to time in various cultural settings, but it's certainly not the most common. Usually patrilineal descent is how things are reckoned. And matrilineal descent is, in most places, unusual. It is kind of an oddity, even though it is actually a more certain way of determining ancestry, because the mother is always certain, whereas the father is never 100% certain, at least to outsiders. So this would also pertain to inheritance rights. He points out that if a Lycian woman married a slave, then her children are deemed pureborn. So in other words, because the mother is a freeborn Lycian woman, the children can inherit that even though their father's a slave. And likewise, if the mother's a foreigner, the children are dishonored and considered worthless. Even if their father is the most preeminent man in the land doesn't matter. They trace their, their descent and also, assumedly, the property rights as well through the mother's line. The Pedasian stronghold being at length taken, and Harpagus having led his army into the plain of Xanthus, the Lycians came out to meet him and did valorous deeds in their battle against odds. But being worsted and driven into the city, they gathered into the citadel their wives and children and goods and servants, and then set the whole citadel on fire. Then they swore each other great oaths, and sallying out they fell fighting, all the men of Xanthus. Of the Xanthians who claim now to be Lycians, the greater number, all saving eighty households, are of foreign descent. These eighty families, as it chanced, were at that time away from the city, and thus they survived. Thus Harpagus gained Xanthus, and Calanus too, in somewhat like manner, the Calanians following for the most part the example of the Lycians. Harpagus then made havoc of Lower Asia, in the upper country Cyrus himself subdued every nation, leaving none untouched. Of the greater part of these I will say nothing, but will speak only of those which gave Cyrus most trouble and are worthiest to be described. 
So the last holdouts against Cyrus, they fall to the forces of Harpagus, and thus the Persians kind of mop up the last remaining resistance in the region of Lydia and the Greek coastline. So Asia Minor is consolidated into Cyrus's control as Cyrus himself is heading out to bring all these other regions around Persia into his own empire and consolidate them all together.